I will abuse my my role of uh, share to ask the the first question to to Natalie. And I'm sorry, I haven't read the paper, so please uh, pardon my ignorance. Uh, but I was really interested in this issue of I think it's an important contribution of different approach, whether we are talking about um, chronic poverty or more those that move around the, the, the poverty line. So my question is uh, about the separability issue, whether it truly really holds that you can say for these two cases that you, that you study that there is a sort of similar trajectory of well-being and then how that affects your, 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 final, your final results. So which two cases? No, sorry. Well, in the case of chronic and transient yeah. Uh, yeah. poverty, I mean, whether you, we can say that, yes, we can observe the similar trajectories of well-being and that holds. Uh, and, I mean, in the case when you're looking at the, the variance, whether that really holds in, the, in both cases. Uh, or, uh, um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're asking holds in, but you said we mm. observe similar, uh, what do you I mean, mean I, that's the trajectories? Or uh, when you're uh, specifying your, yeah. your, your group, right? Yeah. So you, you show different characteristics and, and uh, well, you have the, the issue of that, uh, you have the neutrality, I mean the neutrality of population, but yeah. there were other characteristics that changes and other that did not change. Yeah. When you mentioned, when, when you specified your well-being uh, indicator, yeah. uh, if I understood well when you went through the foster or the separability yeah. issues, uh, it said that um, there is this... Um, uh, what Do you mean I put in my, my the properties where I said constant for constant well-being? Yes. Yes. Ah, so obviously I was going through quite quickly, and maybe <laughs> I didn't explain clearly enough exactly what I was doing there. I hope in the paper I explain that a bit more clearly. Well, I can't promise. <laughs> so, so I'm not at all saying that I believe that my data looks like this. So at this stage, this is a stage in helping me to construct a measure with properties that make sense. So I do like a thought experiment. I say, suppose everybody in my sample was having constant well-being. There's no fluctuations. In that case, what would I want my poverty measure to look like? Now, by going through that thought exper experiment, I can't fully pin down my poverty measures, but I can restrict them quite a lot and pin them down quite a lot. So having kind of gone through that, I then come up with measures that make sense in the case where everyone's constant. And I say, if everyone's constant, then everything must be chronic. And then I can start to think about spreading out from there. And what if I have fluctuations? Now, I still want to stay consistent with what I've done so far, but I have to look further. Does that explain a little bit clearer? It makes sense because also when you look beyond uh, to the more applied level, the issues of vulnerability and vulnerability yeah. to poverty, these, these are the things that you like, like how chalks might change this. Oh, this, this absolutely, whole absolutely. Okay. So I'm not imposing that assumption on the data at all. I'm okay. letting the data tell me what is going okay. on in the data. Okay. Okay. And I'm saying if I, like I'm just using that as a thought experiment along the way to constructing okay. a nice measure. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, I give the floor to, to questions. Uh, Miguel? Yeah. Can I have three questions? Well, uh, yeah. to the three. Yeah, <laughs> okay. one for each. Um, for, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, thanks. For, for Natalie, um, can you explain why, what is it that makes your method uh, different. I mean, in terms of, yeah, so many different methods of chronic poverty. So, so why should, why do we need another one? So, for, no, <laughs> one. Yeah, he wants, Very good question. Yeah. So the second one um, is to Tomoki. So when you present the residuals, of course, and, and you say when the residuals are too too large, then the decomposability of your method is not uh, efficient. So, uh, well, is we so um, at what level of the residuals we can say? that the method may not be necessarily adequate to decompose poverty. And then for Bill, I think um, uh, it's, it's a very interesting point that you're making. And, and what do we do as a development economist? Uh, so it's my question. Okay. Uh, should we gather more questions and then we'll come back to them? 
Uh, I, I would like to ask from uh, Tomoki, you know, how did you, you selected in decomposing some variables, so how did you come up uh, selecting those? Or are they something you, you had a large number or, or, and then you just came down with some, you know, explaining in the best way? So, and to Bill, I would like to ask, uh, Cons you spoke about uh, nutrition and uh, how it should be included in uh, Millennium uh, Development Goals. I wonder, isn't there any, any indicator now among those uh, at present? Or, and uh, are you already doing something to include one additional one just to make a difference? All what you explained, it's uh, massive if it's based on all these studies, uh, etc. Okay, any other question? Uh, we have our colleague. I am Yong Fu Huang uh, from UN Wider. I have three questions. And first question goes to the first speakers. And basically, I think I find your framework is very attractive. Um, you basically decompose the poverty into chronic poverty and transient poverty. And I wonder uh, how you, uh, can you talk about how you differentiate between chronic poverty and transient poverty, especially the transient poverty, um, because this is highly related to um, the economic fluctuation, economic shocks, because the, the poor are more vulnerable to external shocks but you define it as a transient poverty. And also, could you also give some details on how you, you solve the maximization problem in your paper? You're probably using some kinds of dynamic programming or some kinds of, could you give some details? Because I'd like to know more about that. My second question goes to the second speakers. And in your, pa in your paper, you you're talking about the poverty decomposition uh, by using regression approach, especially the integration. You basically look at the linear regression. I wonder if you, you have ever considered the nonlinear regression case. Nonlinear will, will be a different story, I suppose. Okay. My third question goes to the, the third speakers. Okay. And I, I find your, your findings very interesting. And especially when you, you talk about, you mentioned that the worsening nutrition outcome right, are, are related to some kinds of social and economic factors. Right? Well, I wonder if you could discuss the implication of funding for the post-2015 uh, development agenda. Thank you. Okay, um, I will give the, the opportunity to the, to the speakers to respond and then later we can go to another round of uh, questions. Um, so the first question I was asked was basically, well, what does my method add to the several methods that have been proposed in the literature? Um, so my argument is that none of these many methods that have been proposed actually combine a set of sensible properties for chronic poverty measurement. So there are, there are several... Um, several of the measures that have been proposed are kind of nice, well-behaved measures, and if we think about what their properties are, then intuitively that makes an awful lot of sense for measuring something like the total burden of poverty, but in a way that's not sensitive to chronicity or persistence as such. In fact, that goes in the other direction. And I've actually done some work with Catherine Porter, and it's still at working paper stage, but hopefully coming out soon, where we actually kind of look into this, that actually if you, you know, we're interested in vulnerability and depth and so on, and it's actually impossible to combine that in a measure with, with kind of picking up chronicity. So there are several measures which are kind of nice total poverty measures, which just don't, they kind of, they go in the opposite direction from what you'd expect for a chronic poverty measure under certain transformations. Now there are other measures which have been mainly proposed just in the last couple of years, or kind of published in the last couple of years, where this has been recognised and the functional form has been constructed very much in order to pick up this persistence to kind of, like sensitivity to persistence or duration or 
contiguity. The problem with those measures is that the way that those functional forms have been built have had uh, the nasty side effect of actually some pretty dodgy discontinuities, which when you then start thinking about, okay, how does this measure order different alternative trajectories of well-being, you get really weird things going on that just aren't consistent. So like, there's a, it's not that it's impossible to do this, it's just that none of the functions that have been proposed so far kind of do it without unintended consequences. So I'm kind of arguing I want to combine the best from these measures and the best from these measures and actually come up with a measure that combines and makes sense as a chronic poverty measure. Sorry, that was a bit long-winded. Um, hopefully a quicker response to the next question I was asked. So I think you're interested in transient poverty. We're thinking about people who are vulnerable to shocks and so on and so forth. Um, so I, I kind of start with hopefully a fairly sensible measure of total poverty or total burden of poverty. I didn't go into that in any detail, but for this paper, I follow Jalan and Mavalian. They're just simply adding up Foster, Greer, Thorbecker, poverty gap squared over time. Seems a reasonable enough way to say, well, that's the total burden of poverty. So that's total poverty. And then I come up with my chronic poverty measure, which is perfectly consistent with that total poverty measure if this is going back to your point, if everybody is experiencing constant levels of well-being. And then I say, where's the transient poverty? That's the difference between the two. So in this decomposition, the transient poverty is kind of the residual when I compare what's hopefully a sensible measure for total poverty and a sensible measure for chronic poverty. It makes sense to see transient poverty as the residual. And if you know this data set, you'll know there's a lot of shocks, there are lots of vulnerability. And it makes a lot of sense that we saw, what, 60, 80 percent of the poverty in most of those villages actually being categorised as transient poverty. And very, very quickly, your second question, you asked about an optimization problem. There is no optimization problem in my paper. It's, it's a normative. It's, like, so I'm, I'm not doing any positive modelling here. I'm not thinking about behavioural responses to anything. It's simply a kind of a welfare evaluation, poverty measurement kind of thing. So no optimization problem. Okay, so let me first address uh, Miguel's question. Um, so what would be considered adequate decomposition? So, well, first let me explain to you how you can interpret the residual term. So the residual term is the part of poverty that cannot be explained by covariates. So when I say that that component is large, poverty is, can be explained by something that cannot be explained by the model that you have. So if that's too large, you know, well, you know, poverty changes due to something that we don't observe pretty much, which is not particularly informative. How big um, should it be for the decomposition method to be useless? Well, I guess, you know, if that, that component explains, say, 70-80% of the total change, uh, I would say generally it's completely useless. If it's less, you know, depends on how other factors that you are looking at um, are explaining, you know, if it's still, you know, the systematic part explains the substantial part, especially those variables you are really interested in, uh, explain the substantial part of poverty change, I would say that it it may be still informative. Um, I wouldn't dare to you know, make a general statement, but uh, I, I guess it ha the judgment has to be done uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, but that, that's how I um, think about how to judge the usefulness of this decomposition method. Uh, the second question about, uh, about the uh, selection of the model. Um, so, in a way, this is completely arbitrary. You know, you can include whatever you know covariates you're interested in. Um, but uh, I try to include the covariates 
well, that, that, that's reasonably sensible and that varies over time. If, you know, you know that, you know, if it doesn't change over time, you know, uh, you, you know by definition X component is going to be zero. And uh, for, at least for the purpose of illustration, it's not particularly uh, interesting. I also don't want to have, you know, a, a variable that doesn't have much explanatory power. Then it means that, you know, the estimated coefficient is quite unstable. So I, you know, uh, con take into consideration these factors, but there's no uh, single recipe for model selection. At least I haven't found a, uh, found one. Uh, yeah, sure, sure. So, for example, in Tanzania, I don't know how much. Perhaps you know well. They have done uh, lots of work in order to find good indicators in the country in different regions. You know, selecting uh, poverty indicators. They call it Kukuta. So I think uh, if you're interested, you could even look, and there are lots and lots of variables. You know, how people in participatory process, they have determined, you know, how they see what are the most important factors. It would be interesting for you just to look through. How your own variables now? Is it in the National Panel Survey data? I don't know. Okay. Yeah, you have been using. I don't know how they are now measuring it. Is there any Tanzania here? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so my method is constrained by the fact that I have to use panel data. But uh, I appreciate your uh, input. Okay. Yeah. Third one from Yong Fu uh, about this uh, nonlinear model, right? Um, so uh, actually, there is an application that I didn't really discuss properly. But uh, uh, when I use a P0, the poverty rate or headcount index, you know, it's uh, discrete and it doesn't really apply very well. So instead, I, I first run uh, probability regression. And then I use that to decompose poverty. So there I have a nonlinear model uh, instead of having y is equal to you know x. Although you know I have a single index model, um, so uh, this this model can be easily extended. Although in the paper I didn't really discuss nonlinearity much, but uh, this model can be easily extended to the nonlinear case. Provided that it's you know it's a it's a differentiable function basically yeah uh, thank you yeah I think my probably my my main point here is one is to urge people to exercise caution in selecting variables for their models um, I've looked at a couple of the the poster papers that. Um, attempt to use, for example, uh, to estimate the effect of uh, cash transfer programs on nutritional status. And I think the, the weakness of the results is very much explained by the phenomenon that, that I've been discussing this afternoon. Uh, the outcomes that you may get a partial catch-up, but you will not get a complete one. So the, the conclusion is foregone. Um, I think there's a great danger, and we, we as economists tend to think a little bit about nutrition models like production functions. You've got cons mm -hmm. consumption leads to uh, an output, and that output is good nutrition. Um, and that simply is, is not true. The ability of the body to process and utilize food is, uh, is not so straightforward. The, the, the machinery, the technology is, is flawed. Um, I, I think it has also has some interesting ramifications, perhaps in some human capital approaches as well. Um, but I'm I'm not uh, I'm not going in that direction. So it's really I would I would urge people to be very cautious about their selection of nutrition-related variables, um, particularly for children. 
Um, adults suffer from this same condition, um, and, uh, but they've, they've passed the critical growth stage. So it's, the adult indicators are perhaps more reliable. One thing I shouldn't, I don't know if I didn't mention, I don't think I did. Uh, this, there's no cure for this condition, but if you remove people from this environment, they recover it naturally. There's a famous medical study done of Peace Corps volunteers in Pakistan living in rural areas, and they all came down with environmental enteropathy. When they went back to the United States, they, with no medical treatment whatsoever, they all slowly recovered. Um, I also mentioned it's, it's largely a rural phenomenon in urban areas with um, access to hygiene and, and sewerage and what, what have you. It doesn't occur to any uh, great extent. I would not urge um, this kind of nutritional indicator to be included in Millennium Development Goals. Why? Because there's enormous pressure being placed on uh, low-income countries to monitor the indicators of Millennium Development Goals, and I think this would be a huge wasted expenditure to, to attempt to do this, except in a, uh, in a very very controlled, very precise manner. Uh, I just think it would be a huge waste of funding. Um, and it, as I say, it doesn't indicate, um, it doesn't indicate anything about, new, about economic or social welfare. It simply tells you something about nutritional status. So if, if you identify um, poor, chronic undernutrition, you still have a question of what the, what the heck do you do about it? Um, Um, any other question or comments? Uh, <laughs> yes, no, I think it's been a very rich mm -hmm. discussion, and particularly the, the last reflection about exercise caution in selective variables. I don't think it applies only to the health-related indicators, but to other indicators as well, and I think it's a, it's a lesson. And I would love to see this, this panel and how we can use it for, for uh, studying other issues in Africa. I have used the health um, surveys myself in the absence of other household or survey data in, in other countries, and I think they have a very you, very good technique, and that could be a good, compa good comparator between countries. So I, I really appreciate your, your effort, and I hope to see the, the paper and the final panel. Hopefully it can be used. And going back to the point of measurements and indicators, that was a huge discussion when framing the new post-2015 development agenda, because um, the question is, okay, we spent 10 plus years plus resources donors, countries themselves, trying to measure what are targets towards air poverty eradication, but what about the, the policy environment? What about the, the policy design? What is about the framework? And now we are moving from targets, indicators, to what are core, uh, we call paradigms. And, and again, when we look at issues like chronic poverty, we're we talking about, okay, poverty rate is reducing, but what about what is going under that, that line that we draw? So I think this has been a very rich, um, uh, session from the technical point of view, but also from the from the messages that emanate. And uh, as I said, I look forward to reading the papers. And uh, if you have any questions, you have the the emails, so you can contact the, the authors directly. So please join me in thanking the, the authors.